Chapter 39, Care of the Patients with Problems with the Central Nervous System, the Brain. We're going to begin on page 843. Alzheimer's disease, Alzheimer's dementia, is also known by. This is the most common type of dementia. There are microscopic changes that happen in the brain in several different areas. There are neurotransmitter abnormalities, changes um, in cognition, behavior, personality, and self-management skills are the result of the changes in the brain. People who are over 65 account for 60% of the dementia cases. The exact cause of Alzheimer's is unknown. The exact reason for Alzheimer's is unknown, but it does strike people over the age of 65 most often. Women are more likely to develop the disease than men. And there is obviously a genetic component. They do know that much, but they do not know exactly what causes um, the disease. Also, if you look on page 845, it talks about veterans who have experienced a traumatic brain injury or repeated head trauma um, are more at risk for Alzheimer's dementia at an earlier age than other people. Also, those who have post-traumatic stress disorder are twice as likely to develop dementia than veterans without PTSD. Also, African Americans and Hispanics are at a greater risk for developing Alzheimer's when compared to non-Hispanic whites. And they don't know exactly why, what the difference is. If you look on page 844, there is table 39.1 that gives you a comparison of the two major types of dementia. We have Alzheimer's disease and vascular dementia. So there, again, a higher incidence and prevalence after age 65, but it can affect anyone older than age 40, and 5.7 million are affected in the United States. It's probably higher than that now. Unfortunately, there is no way to prevent Alzheimer's. It is a chronic health problem, and chronic health problems may contribute to the disease. Diet and exercise, and of course, smoking and drinking are also possible factors because they're factors in every other disease that we talk about. Okay, when assessing a patient with Alzheimer's, you want to know about the onset duration, the progression of the symptoms. You want to know how they are functioning, okay? This is a slow progressing disease. It does go or occur in stages. Attention, concentration, judgment, perception, learning memory, um, communication and language and information processing are all affected by Alzheimer's, okay? So the first four years um, in early Alzheimer's, there will be short-term memory loss, mild cognitive impairment, but the patient can typically remain independent with their ADLs. In the middle stage, that will occur over the next two or three years. So the first stage is the first four years, and then the next two to three years, there is more impaired cognition, problems handling money. They may be disoriented at times. They may have speech and language deficits. They may start experiencing incontinence. They also may begin wandering where, you know, maybe they um, sneak out of the house when whoever's supposed to be watching them isn't looking or when their spouse isn't around um, or they say they're going to go get the mail but then they take off down the road and they kind of forget where they are. That's the dangerous part of Alzheimer's dementia. And then sundowners. Um, in case you're not familiar, sundowners is when people get confused after the sun goes down. Um, and there's not really a certain cause for this phenomena but it is a true phenomena and it does happen. Then the late stage of Alzheimer's, the patient will be dependent in all areas. They are bedridden. They have a loss of facial recognition that's called agnosia. They have aphasia. There is severe physical deterioration and they will usually succumb to death um, due to immobility. So how do we help these individuals as far as psychosocially doing a psychosocial assessment because their personality and behaviors are affected? Um, 
They need a routine environment. They need to be for things to be very stable. They need to be able to recognize where they are and everything and who they're around. They don't need a lot of change, okay? If you look on page 846, there is a key features of Alzheimer's box, and that gives you the early, middle, and late stages again. Lab and imaging, there is no specific lab test that can be done at all for Alzheimer's to determine anything about it. The only way to definitively get a diagnosis is when they examine the brain tissue during an autopsy, so after death, okay? There can be genetic testing done, but this will not predict somebody getting Alzheimer's, but it does help to diagnose it. The CT and MRI scans may identify treatable causes of dementia or delirium. And when they do an EEG, that's where they look at the brain waves. The brain waves do move more slowly than they should. Hypotheses are decreased memory and cognition due to neural changes in the brain. Potential for injury for, or falls due to wandering or inability to ambulate independently. Potential for elder abuse by caregivers due to the patient's prolonged progression of disability and the patient's increasing care needs. It does take an awful lot out of the people who are caring for Alzheimer's patients. Generating solutions and taking action. We want to manage their memory and cognitive dysfunction, prevent injuries or falls. Well, what are we going to do for this person who's confused and doesn't know where they are or maybe wanders? Okay, we're gonna make sure that they have a well-lit area and at night there's a light on. We're going to offer toileting so that um, there's no surprises or hopefully there's no surprises. To prevent elder abuse, um, that is like a huge thing, of course, we want to take care of our elderly who can't defend themselves. Um, one way to promote communication with somebody with Alzheimer's is on page 849. You're going to want to ask simple direct questions that require only yes or no. Provide instructions with pictures in a place that the patient will see uh, if, if he or she can read them. Use simple short sentences, use gestures to help the patient understand what you're saying, validate the patient's feelings as needed, limit choices. You don't wanna give them a whole bunch of choices. Um, that's just gonna make them more confused. Never assume the patient is totally confused and cannot understand what is being communicated. And try to anticipate the patient's needs and interpret nonverbal communication. Okay, so they need a structured environment. They need cognitive stimulation therapy. So in other words, they don't need to just be left alone. Um, they need to have things that will stimulate their brain, activities and things. We need to create mindfulness. We can post videos of the family or pictures or even voice recordings um, in their room or in their home so that they can hear their family and see them. Animal therapy is another good thing that we do. For medications, there is cholinesterase inhibitors. These slow the cognitive decline. We also give them antidepressants and antipsychotics, psychotics if they are um, hallucinating, which sometimes happens late in the disease. If you look on page 850, there is a best practice box, approaches to prevent and manage wandering in hospital patients. So the best thing that we can do is keep an eye on them. So observation, um, provide appropriate supervision, frequent checks, place the patient in an area that provides maximum observation. Um, it says, but not in a nurse's station, but sometimes we have to do that. Use family members, friends, and volunteers and sitters to monitor the patient. Keep the patient away from stairs or elevators. That is a must. Don't change rooms. You don't wanna have them confused. Remember, we want them to have a really stable environment as much as possible. Avoid physical or chemical restraints. Assess and treat pain. Use reorientation methods. 
Provide frequent toileting and incontinence care as needed. Use bed and chair alarms as needed. Prevent overstimulation such as excessive noise and use soft music and non-glare lighting if possible. So while we want them to have some stimulation, we don't want them to get too much where they get irritated. Okay, transition home care management. Um, there's something called respite care, and that is actually to give the caregivers a, a break, okay? Um, you always want to have some kind of plan in place in case the patient either becomes agitated or violent or starts wandering, um, trying to get out or leaving. Remember, we want to establish a routine and we want a calm environment. Okay, we want to teach the family about any medications that the patient's on. We also want them to know that it's best if we can maintain mobility as long as possible. Um, and there is the Alzheimer's Association as a resource. Now, if you look on page 851, table 39.2, we have minimizing behavior problems for patients with Alzheimer's disease at home. And then on page 852, we have patient family education, reducing family and informal caregiver stress. Okay, this really is a huge problem. Um, because it just takes so much out of people, especially people who aren't medical. Um, so you have to encourage the family that it's okay to get frustrated. Sometimes they may have to just walk away for a minute. Um, and also to use humor as much as possible and um, to, to get that respite care when they need it. So we want to maintain memory and cognition for as long as possible and increase their quality of life. We want them to remain injury free and we want to manage their caregiver stress to prevent elder abuse. Parkinson's disease. This is on page 853. This is a progressive neurodegenerative disorder. There are four cardinal symptoms of Parkinson's. Tremor, muscle rigidity, where they have like a mask-like face. There's really no expression to their face. Bradykinesia, which is moving really slowly. And then postural instability. That's what causes a shuffling gait and a stooped posture. The um, persons with Parkinson have a decreased level of dopamine. So there's difficulty initiating and coordinating voluntary movements. That's part of that, um, bradykinesia and the instability. So there's no exact cause for Parkinson's. They think maybe environmental and genetic factors. Risk factors include exposure to chemicals and metals, people older than 40, and if it runs in your family. On page 855, you can see um, a picture of that mask-like facial expression. So as far as um, incidence and prevalence, 60,000 new cases annually in people over 50, 1 million people live with Parkinson's, and it's more often um, in men than women, 50% more men than women. When taking a history, we want to know when the symptoms started. Physical assessment, notice do they have resting tremors in their upper extremities? Do a rigidity assessment. Do they have that mask-like expression where their face doesn't really move? Does the family or spouse report emotional changes? Do they have speech changes and bowel and bladder changes? Again, with the laboratory, there is um, no specific diagnostic tests. Um, they can check cerebral spinal fluid. They can do an MRI. Um, the SPECT is the Single Photon Emission Computed Tomography. This just rules out other CNS problems. There are um, MRIs that can differentiate Parkinson's specifically. And the CSF, you'll see decreased dopamine levels. That's why they look at that. And on page 854, box 39.1, there are stages of Parkinson's disease. 
So in stage one, the initial stage, there's minimal weakness, but um, they'll start having those tremors. Stage two, they get the mask-like face and start that shuffling gait. Um, stage three, postural instability, more problems moving, walking. And then stage four is the severe disability where they become rigid and have akinesia. Then stage five is complete dependence. And here's that picture I was talking about on page 855 in your text. So we're looking at decreased mobility and impaired cognition. We want to promote mobility. There is non-surgical management such as exercise, physical therapy. Um, there are medications that we do give, anti-Parkinson medications such as levodopa, dopamine agonists such as Requip, anticholinergics such as Cogentin, antivirals that decrease the rigidity and tremors. We also give antidepressants to um, our Parkinson's patients. Surgical management is really a last resort. That is not something that we typically do. So um, one of the things about these drugs that we're talking about that's kind of important to know is that there is a greater chance of toxicity. So the drug may have to be decreased um, if needed. Also, they can actually prescribe a drug holiday, which is kind of interesting to me, but they prescribe a drug holiday and stop the medication for 10 days to sort of let their system settle out um, and then they start again. As far as managing cognitive dysfunction, we're going to have a speech consult. We're going to have a communication board, um, do as much as we can to have them as independent and to be able to communicate as well as possible. On 856, there is care of the patient with Parkinson's disease, your best practice box. So look at that. Um, things like collaborating with a dietitian, um, recognize that it can, Parkinson's can affect a person's self-esteem, um, monitor for drug side effects like I was talking about. Um, it's not unusual for them to become toxic on some of these medications. Allow the patient time to perform their ADLs and their mobility skills. Um, I had a patient with Parkinson's one time that would come to exercise at cardiac rehab and he would do the little shuffle walk and he would, he kind of had a mumbly sound to his voice. He couldn't really articulate well, but he was so funny. He would crack jokes all the time. Um, and he was not cognitively impaired and he was just a lot of fun. So never prejudge people. You don't know, um, you know, what kind of personality they, they might really have underneath all their, all their difficulties. For home care, we're going to ensure safety by removing dangerous objects. We want to be positive and calm and minimize any agitation to the patient. Um, we want to help them, for instance, with the tremors. They may have difficulty eating and drinking at some point without spilling. Um, so you want to take, you know, precautions and teach the family and caregivers, um, you know, how to put a towel over them and um, they may need some plates and things that function for people with disabilities, okay? So cups with lids and stuff like that. So we want to improve mobility and we want to maintain safety and an acceptable quality of life. Moving on to migraine headaches. I know some of you who are familiar with these. Okay, these are recurrent episodic attacks of head pain, often with nausea, sensitivity to light or sound or head movement. Some patients have food triggers, um, red wine, caffeine, MSG. Some migraines will come on with an aura, so people will see an aura before the migraine starts. Sometimes that is um, a clue that people, you know, know that they're going to get a migraine and then they can hopefully head it off with some medication. With pain management, we call it abortive therapy when we're talking about stopping 
the migraine when it's in that aura phase. Um, so if you can stop it and abort the headache, that is the goal, okay? Um, also using NSAIDs, triptan preparations, there are all kinds of um, combination drugs and things that are used. And I think what has to be done is they just have to find out what works for which patient. So look on page 860, and there is a key features box, key features of migraine headaches. And there is the first phase, second phase, and third phase, um, the migraine without the aura, and then the atypical migraine. So talking more about the drugs that are used. Okay, so we have NSAIDs or um, Tylenol, APAP acetaminophen, Tylenol. Triptan will relieve the headache by activating serotonin receptors. It has a vasoconstriction effect. Um, you can't use it for heart patients, okay? It can cause chest pain. And this is another one where you want to make sure somebody is using birth control if they are of the age um, that they would still be able to get pregnant. Ergotamine. You do not give within 24 hours of a triptan drug. You can take it up, you can take up to six tablets in 24 hours, and they need to take it as soon as possible. That's the ergotamine. Isomethaptine is a combination drug with Tylenol in it, and it is given when the above medications don't work. So when the ergotamine or the triptan does not work. Um, or if you have a heart patient that can't take the triptan and the ergotamine doesn't work, then they would give the combination isomethaptine. Um, propanolol is another medication that they can give. This is to prevent vascular changes um, that sometimes bring on migraines. Okay. Seizures and epilepsy. Seizures are the uncontrolled electrical discharge of neurons in the brain. They result in change of level of consciousness. Um, people don't, aren't aware of their surroundings. Um, I'm sure you've seen a seizure. If you haven't seen it in person, you've seen them on TV or in the movies. Um, so you know what they look like. Epilepsy is when they have a chronic disorder in which there are repeated seizures. And this is on page 863 of your text. Different types of seizures. The tonic-clonic is evidenced by stiff muscles and loss of consciousness, a rhythmic jerking of all the extremities lasting two to five minutes. Myoclonic lasts just a few seconds and there's a brief jerking of the extremities. Akinetic, there's a loss of muscle tone followed by confusion. So people will just kind of fall out. Um, a partial seizure, local or focal, happens in adults. In the complex partial, there's a loss of consciousness for one to three minutes. And then they have amnesia after the complex partial. This is also known as the temporal lobe seizure. The primary reason that people have seizures is genetics. So if it runs in the family, um, you're gonna have to watch out. The secondary reason for seizures is an underlying brain lesion. So if there's been trauma to the brain, a metabolic disorder, alcohol withdrawal, electrolyte disturbance, high fever, stroke, head injury, substance abuse, and even heart disease. When we're assessing the patient that has seizures or epilepsy, we want to know the number of seizures they have, what time of day it is, how long they last, what's the pattern, what's the seizure look like, what's happening in the pre phase, that means before they have the seizure, do they see an aura, do they have any kind of warning that a seizure is coming. Of course, their other medical history, are they diabetic, do they have heart disease. Um, we want to do an EEG to look at their brain waves. They can do CTs and MRIs. Um, we talked about the SPEC and even a PET scan for um, a cancerous tumor that might be pressing on something causing um, seizures, okay? Non-surgically, there are medications. You want to look at box 39.2. 
on page 864 at the medications there. Um, drug therapy is a major component of the management. You want them to stay on their epilept anti-epileptic drugs. They cannot just go off of them, okay? They want to keep um, follow-up appointments, make sure their, you know, people are watching their lab tests, um, make sure their drugs are effective, but they're not getting toxic, okay? As far as surgical management, um, surgical management is not done a lot, but if they have to do it because they cannot manage it non-surgically with medications, um, there is something called vagal nerve stimulation surgery that they do. Um, they call it the pacemaker for the brain, okay? Um, so that's done if needed. And let's talk about seizure precautions for a minute. Um, this is another non-surgical thing that we do to help manage seizures. Anybody that has a history of seizures or who's suspected to start having seizures or something is something like that, um, we're going to put them on seizure precautions. So the side rails of the bed in the hospital will be padded, okay? Um, now your book will say that typically, you know, padded side rails embarrass the patient, so we're not really doing that anymore. But yeah, we are pretty much um, because we don't want them to fall on the floor while they're having a seizure, okay? So padded tongue blades, that's something that we used to do. We used to keep one at the bedside and we don't do that anymore because we don't want to put something in the patient's mouth, okay? We do not stick anything in the patient's mouth anymore when they're having a seizure. We used to tell people to put a tongue blade or something to prevent their teeth um, from hitting or for them biting their tongue. But now we have found that there's more problems with somebody choking on whatever's in their mouth. So we don't put anything in their mouth. We want to turn them on their side. Um, try to keep the airway clear, remove anything around the patient that might hurt them, suction if possible. If you're in the hospital, you can certainly um, suction the patient, suck, suck, suction out their mouth, um, loosen any restrictive clothing the patient is wearing, do not restrain or try to stop the patient's movements. You can like hold on to their arm and kind of guide them from hitting something like a wall or a chair. Um, and record the time that the seizure begins and ends. Status epilepticus is when somebody keeps seizing. The seizure lasts over five minutes or they keep repeating for like 30 minutes, okay? This is a medical emergency. We are going to IV push lorazepam or diazepam. There is also a diazepam rectal gel that they use. Um, it's four milligrams over two minutes, and you can repeat that, okay? That's the IV push. So looking at causes of status ep epilepticus, the top of page 865, sudden withdrawal from anti-epileptic drugs. So very important that we teach patients they can't just go off of them. They've got to stay on their medications. Acute alcohol and drug withdrawal, head trauma, cerebral trauma, excuse me, cerebral edema, or metabolic disturbances. Um, the critical rescue right underneath that says convulsive status epilepticus must be treated promptly and aggressively. You want to make sure the patient has an airway. Um, that is the priority for the patient's care. We want the patient to be compliant with their anti-epilepsy drugs. They will need a social services referral. Um, they need to eat a nutritious diet and get plenty of rest and reduce their stress. And meningitis is our final um, problem for the brain that we're going to talk about in chapter 39. This is an infection of the meninges of the brain and spinal cord. Um, it is, can be either viral or bacterial. And this is on page 866 of your book. 
there is a key features box on page 867. And one of the things that we notice typically with meningitis is a stiff neck. So nuchal rigidity, that's what that means, neck stiffness. Also neurologic and neurovascular assessment needs to be done. Um, the patient may exhibit signs of increased intracranial pressure. They may be sensitive to light. Um, they may have nystagmus where their eyes are moving back and forth rapidly. Um, there's also a care of the patient box on page 868. So in um, interventions for these patients, Vaccination to prevent meningitis, acute monitoring and documentation of the neurological status, broad spectrum antibiotics, and a vascular assessment. Now, I'm looking at the um, best practice box. What's your priority? Airway, airway, breathing, circulation. Take your vital signs and perform neuro checks every two to four hours. Perform cranial nerve assessments, manage pain, perform vascular assessment. Give drugs and IV fluid as prescribed, record their intake and output carefully, monitor their body weight for um, catching fluid retention quickly, okay? That's why we want to monitor their body weight. Um, monitor lab values closely. Position carefully to prevent pressure injuries. Perform range of motion exercises every four hours as needed decreased environmental stimuli. So we want to provide a quiet environment and minimize exposure to bright lights and windows and overhead lights. Maintain bed rest and we want the head of the bed up. We want them on transmission-based precautions um, if they have bacterial meningitis. Okay, monitor for complications such as increased intracranial pressure, vascular dysfunction, fluid and electrolyte imbalance, seizures, and shock. And I'm going to let y'all go over the case study yourself. And thank you for your time.